Thank you very much. My life started here on the corner of 14th and Yesler. So uh, shortly after World War II ended, uh, my parents who were interned in the Minidoka internment camp, uh, they actually started a family here. Uh, we lived in a three-room tenement, a kitchen, a family room, and a bedroom. Six of us, my parents, me, my brother, my sister, and my grandmother. Um, so it was kind of crowded. Uh, I, I could probably say it's been a very interesting life. Uh, one thing is, uh, that has been consistent is I've worked really hard. Uh, at the age of five, we would sit around the kitchen table and we would tie fishing tackle for five cents a piece. At the age of 10, I was picking berries every summer on a farm in Auburn. At 13, I was teaching drums to adults. At 14, I was the car wash attendant at the Pink Elephant Car Wash. <laughs> at 16, I was delivering mail for the post office. At 19, I served in the Air Force. Um, I've only attended public schools, so K through 18. Um, shortly after I graduated with my MBA, I started working for Hewlett Packard. I was an accountant, I was a kind of a programmer, I was a product marketing manager, and it was then that I was at a party and I met uh, three other guys. They were actually working for Boston Consulting Group. And we started chatting and they said, you know, we kind of want to start a software company. And I said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. Uh, and so we did. Uh, we actually quit our jobs, we raised venture capital dollars, we started that company and promptly ran it right into the ground. <laughs> uh, it was a great learning experience. Then I met this guy. I actually wrote a letter. I, had, uh, I was working in Silicon Valley and I, I came upon this company called Microsoft, you know, back in Seattle. I'm going, well, who is this guy, this Bill Gates? Anyways, I ended up writing a letter uh, to Bill saying that, you know, I was kind of interested in, in maybe getting a job there. Uh, for whatever reason, they invited me up for, uh, for a round of interviews. Uh, they ultimately, Bill uh, made me an offer to be manager special accounts. One of those special accounts was IBM. Pretty big deal. Uh, but I saw a bigger opportunity at Microsoft. And so I spent the first year writing a business plan, or first month, excuse me, writing a business plan to found the international division. Um, to this day, I still have no reason why Bill let me do that. I, I only speak English. I had never ever done business internationally before. <laughs> and I had just run my own software company into the ground. <laughs> but, but I knew how to work hard, right? I, 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 that was ingrained in me from, from birth. I knew how to work hard. And in fact, I remember commenting to Bill, you know, Bill, I've been here for three years and I haven't taken a single day off. And Bill said, so what? <laughs> he said, I've worked seven years without taking a day off. Okay, so he put it in perspective. <laughs> Nevertheless, four years after we founded the International Division, uh, the International Division accounted for 42% of top line revenues and over half the profits for the company. I would be asked, uh, invited, to come before the Microsoft board about once a year to talk about anything that I wanted. And so one year, uh, I think this was 1989, uh, Microsoft was developing two operating systems. One was a joint thing with IBM called OS2. The other thing was this thing we now know as Windows. And I went before the board and I, I basically said, you know what we ought to do is we ought to give OS2 back to IBM. Microsoft ought to focus solely on Windows. And the reason why? is because all of the application software competitors were only developing, they're only porting their applications to OS2. We pleaded with them to port to both operating systems with the, you know, scarce resources. They only ported to OS2. Microsoft was the only company porting to both OS2 and Windows. And I basically argued, uh, you know, with the board, I said, you know, so if we get rid of OS2 and we make Windows successful, we'd be the only company with Windows apps, we would preempt the market. The rest is history. Um, I got married. We started having kids. Uh, and ultimately, I wanted to focus on family. So I retired on March 1st, 1992, exactly 10 years to the day of when I started at Microsoft. You know, my first six weeks of retirement was really hard work. 
I, I literally pounded thousands of golf balls every single day for six weeks. Uh, I, you know, I, I quickly came to the realization that I wasn't going to make the PGA Tour. So one afternoon, I literally sat myself down under a tree to try to figure out what it was I was going to do with the rest of my life. And it was that afternoon that I crafted my personal mission statement, which is to marry my passion for things entrepreneurial with things philanthropic in ways that encourage others to do the same. Well, how has this manifested itself? For the past two decades, I have been a full-time volunteer in the nonprofit sector. I have served on over 100 nonprofit boards. Uh, the ones in kind of the orange color there are, are the ones that I have founded or co-founded. The scar tissue I've acquired is being applied to my two most recent nonprofit startups. The newest is called the Parents' Union. I'm only going to briefly touch on this one. Uh, when I wrote my book, Outrageous Learning, having to do with education reform, I was very frustrated because even though I had some what I think are good ideas, um, I couldn't figure out what the catalyst was going to be to cause systemic reform to actually happen. And then I had an epiphany after the book was published. That epiphany was, you know, we really need to engage parents, a broad base of parents who can speak with a unified voice to cause change to happen. And that change can be legislative change at the state level, it can be policy change at the school district level, or it can be change that happens within every schoolhouse. Stay tuned. Um, we're just now starting on this one. The second one uh, is, uh, is a nonprofit called seeyourimpact.org. A few years ago, Divya J. Chauhan, who is the co-founder um, of See Your Impact, uh, asked for a meeting with me. And he wanted to kind of dig down into some of the nonprofit, you know, experiences that I've had. And so we talked and we talked and we talked. And, and uh, basically we concluded two uh, very uh, big things. One was that there is enormous potential at the bottom of the philanthropic pyramid. Um, here's the factoid. Every year, Americans give about $350 billion a year. U.S. corporations account for 15 billions of, uh, of that. U.S. foundations, another 40 billion. Individuals account for $300 billion a year of giving. So it's really tremendous. The second thing we concluded was donors, big or small, almost never ever see the beneficiary of their giving. You actually never see the human being whose life is being impacted. Well, see your impact is changing this. These are just four examples of families who have been impacted by clean water kits. What's more profound is that these gifts were made possible by Ellie. Ellie is the one in the corner there, upside down. <laughs> Instead of toys, she asked people, friends, right, to make small donations instead of giving her plastic toys. And it's those donations that essentially allowed donations to be made to NGOs who were focused on clean water. Well, if Ellie can do this, every single one of us can do that. Birthdays, bar mitzvahs, anniversaries, weddings, you name it. We can all launch campaigns very similar to Ellie's. These two Ethiopian children represent tens of thousands who have been impacted by the drought and famine in the Horn of Africa. Naimo, who is the little child on the right, um, has tuberculosis and he has diarrhea. Naimo received treatment at a World Vision Clinic uh, in Somalia thanks to Sarah. Who is Sarah? Well, Sarah is a Seattle mother who adopted two Ethiopian children. She wanted to do something to alleviate all of the suffering. So she came to see your impact and she said, you know, I've got this idea. I want to do this five for five campaign. And what she did was she sent out email to 200 of her friends to donate $5. And then she asked those friends to ask five of their friends to donate $5. Her original goal was to raise $500. Six weeks later, she's raised almost $40,000. Imagine tens of thousands of Sarah's doing the same thing. The potential is enormous. Here's another example. Special Olympics. You know, what if you were asked by someone that you knew who was doing Special Olympics 
to, to make a small gift to help pay for their participation in the program. If someone were to ask me for five or ten dollars or twenty dollars, would I say no? I don't think so. It's a big idea that can be applied to Boys and Girls Club, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, YWCAs, you, ne you name the youth organization, all of them can benefit from this platform. Well, we heard what Ellie and Sarah did. Begs the question, what can you do? $10 buys a bed net. $15 buys a three-month supply of vitamin packs uh, in Sierra Leone. $45 purchases a solar lantern in India. There are 400 million people in India that don't have access to electricity. $65 buys a uh, water kit in Nicaragua. $200 buys a latrine uh, in Nepal. $240 pays for a whole year of private schooling in India. It's this collective power at the base of the philanthropic pyramid that can alleviate suffering and solve global problems. This platform is going to be huge. The first step, you're all here. The second step is go to the See Your Impact website and make a gift. You'll be richer for it. Thank you.